Thanks, Chuck. We're in um, a sermon series right now on the Ten Commandments. Typically, we would um, preach through the Bible section by section, book, uh, book, uh, from the beginning of a book to the end of a book. But once a year or so, we pick a more or less a topical series to hone in on a theme that Scripture speaks about and turn it over like a diamond to see all that it's worth. We're looking at the Ten Commandments, one commandment per Sunday, and we're in the third commandment, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Typically when we think about the commandments of God, especially the Ten Commandments, we see how short and brief they are. So we don't think much of them. Very simple, very plain, straight to the point. But that leaves us only considering the duty that we have to obey them. We usually don't meditate on them in a way to ever understand what purpose each commandment is driving us toward, and the third dimension, what kind of character and attributes and, and virtue should fill us up as we walk uh, in our duty to God and to our neighbor towards the purpose for which God designed it. So we have an example up here to see if, if we've been commanded not to commit adultery, well, what would be the purpose? I mean, is it simply enough that you don't cheat on a spouse? Well, no. We need to be walking towards the purpose which it is driving us towards and, be, and understand that this is, there's a goal that's intended here which would help us understand with wisdom the discernment between different decisions which might not be so clear. So, for example, to love your neighbor would be a goal. And yet, our heart is not left out of this calling. Jesus so often corrected the Pharisees, saying, you are hypocrites. They were obeying the commandments. How are they hypocrites? Because he says, on the outside, you're whitewashed tombs. You're obedient to the commandments. But on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones. Your heart hasn't been changed. You're the same kinds of people. So we see character is, is also part of this, this dimension of obeying and knowing God's commandments. And so that's what we're looking at as we meditate on each commandment. Not only what is the duty, but also what is the purpose that it's driving us toward as a people in a society. And then what is the virtue? What is the kind of character qualities that should well up within us as we walk in God's ways? Let me pray for us as we look into this third commandment. Father, we are grateful to be called your people we're grateful to hear from you today. Much better than hearing from me or any other person who could stand on the stage to speak. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your word has to say by your spirit so that we might behold the glory of Jesus Christ and be forever changed by him. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray to you. Amen. I continue to have a fear of heights, even though I've jumped off many things, and people would say I've conquered this fear. I'm still, I'm still terrified of heights. It began when I was maybe 12 years old that I learned I was afraid of heights. A man from our church who was in the Army Special Forces back in his heyday uh, had multiple sons, and so he took me and my brother out rock climbing. And he taught us how to scale a wall. He taught us how to tie the knots. He taught us how to rappel off a, uh, off a cliff. And he, when I got up to the top of the cliff, my knees were shaking. I was not going down that day, and I did not go down that day. I went back around on the mountain, and my younger brother, three years younger than me, just zipped on down like he was ready to join the Army Special Forces himself. I was terrified of heights. But something uh, that man told me forever changed my ability to face heights. He told me at the top of the mountain, he said, you know, it, it's actually the people who aren't afraid that get hurt. The people who aren't afraid are the ones who get hurt. So he was showing me fear is a good thing when it, when it dr drives you to recognize something for what it is and approach it the proper way. If you have the right fear, you know where you can fall. Therefore, your confidence is going to be right on track. You can be more confident than those who are reckless when you are reverent because you know how you can fall. Now, if we are reckless with how we use 
or misuse or even abuse God's name, we are due the righteous judgment that fools who jump off cliffs and reckless drivers deserve when they go about in their own way. They deserve the consequences for those actions. After all, the second clause in this verse, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And yet this prohibition implies there is a proper use. Some people might think, oh, this is such a stern warning. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Do not misuse the name of the Lord. We should never use it at all. But when he calls us to not misuse it, he implies us there is a proper use, which directs us towards reverence for God and leads us into confidence before him. When we approach God with the reverence and awe that his name is due, we will actually be able to receive the benefits for what his name is given to us for. So let's see how, by breaking this commandment down, the, the duty of the commandment, the purpose of the commandment, and the character of this commandment. Now, although the New International Version of our English Bible says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord, the King James Version gives us a different angle, I think, and is a little bit more comprehensive when it says, thou shalt not use, take the Lord's name in vain. I'm sure that's how most of you think of this verse. Do not take the Lord's in vain. What does it mean to misuse God's name or to take it in vain? Well, listen to the use of this Hebrew word for vain and see if you can pick up a pattern. What does vain mean in how it's used in Scripture? Jeremiah chapter 2. In vain have I struck your children. They took no correction. Jeremiah 4. In vain you beautify yourself. Your lovers despise you. Jeremiah 46. In vain you have used medicines. There's no healing for you. Isaiah 29. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Conclusion, in vain do they worship me. Did you pick up a pattern? What does the Lord mean in his use of the word vain? He means that there is an effort that you're putting into something, but there's no effect. There's no result. All, it was all for nothing. Using God's name carelessly or crassly is one way where, where the use of his name is all for nothing. It does not accomplish any of the purposes for which he gave it. So this elementary understanding of using God's name in vain, we think of using God's name as a curse word or a flippant phrase when we stub our toe, is absolutely relevant, is absolutely applying to this commandment. Do not use his name carelessly. Do not use his name for no effect or for your own effect. There is a specific effect using this name is meant to have. Another way we could um, take the name of the Lord in vain would be from an ancient vow. Um, People in the ancient world would use vows to say, I swear by the Lord's name. I I swear in in the name of the Lord. I promise according to the name of the Lord, I will do X, Y, or Z. And then they don't fulfill it. They mustered up all of this effort to convince you they were going to surely follow through and do what they've said because they swore by their mother's grave, right? By, By the name of the Lord. But there was no effect in the end. It was all for nothing. They used the name of the Lord's Uh, They use the name of the Lord in vain. Yet there's another aspect of using the Lord's name in vain, one in which perhaps you'll be thinking about this song the rest of the day. Carly Simon's hit song from the 70s, You're So Vain. She gives us another angle. She's not trying to expound Exodus 20, verse 7. But in her verse, uh, 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 in in the verse and choruses of, of her song, she says, you're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. 
this song is about a man who thinks the world revolves around him. If he were invited to a party, he would think the party was about him. If he heard a song, he would think the song was about him. He was so vain, he thought everything was about him. Vanity in this sense means self-serving. And it's another way we find people in Scripture using God's name in vain. Worse than misusing God's name, this is abusing God's name. One example could be taking the Lord's name in vain by pronouncing his name itself as, it, as if it were a weapon to be wielded and taken up by whoever could grab it. First Kings chapter 22, King Balak of Moab heard the Israelites were coming. So what did he do? He hired an Israelite prophet to prophesy against Israel, the Israelites in the name of the Lord. He says, all of my prophets are worthless. Perhaps if I get an Israelite prophet who will prophesy in the name of the Lord, it will come to pass. And we find out the result. Acts chapter 19 in the New Testament. Some Jewish um, um, sons of a high priest saw and heard the apostle Paul casting out demons in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus. So what did they do? They tried it themselves. They, tried, they, they went up to this demon-possessed man and said, in the name of Jesus, we command you to come out. And you know what the demons responded through the man? We've heard of Paul, and we've heard of Jesus, but who are you? And they beat up all, their, uh, all, the, all of the brothers and left them running home naked and beaten. We take God's name in vain when we separate God's name from God's power, God's person, and his own presence from his power. Like an FBI agent who lures somebody in, gets what they want, and says, we have no more need for you anymore. The only time the power of God is present is if he sees fit to manifest it by his presence in the Holy Spirit. God's name is not at our disposal to use whenever we see fit or whenever we decide to speak his name, as if he were a genie in the bottle that came out every time we rubbed the lamp. In our earnestness to see God's power, to see God move, and to see God heal or God save, we might want to, out of turn, speak the name of Jesus and cast out whatever we think is, is there in front of us, as if we can just wield his name as a power. But that is to take the Lord's name in vain. If nothing happens, why? Have we not taken the Lord's name in vain, separating his name from his own person? Scripture never calls us to just pronounce God's name or the name of Jesus, but rather to petition God, to go to God, to, to pray to him through the name of Jesus and ask him to work. Do not pronounce the name of God or the name of Jesus thinking there is power in the sounds your voice is making. Rather, go directly to God in prayer. Appeal to him through the name of Jesus and see if he will see fit to work in the circumstance. That's why at the end of the service, when we pronounce blessing over you, I don't come up with what I think is cute and sweet for the day that ties into the sermon. I search the scriptures to see what has God said that I can give to this people. Something of substance here. Something that God has said himself. So that you can actually be confident in those words. Another way in scripture that we see people taking the Lord's name in vain. I've already mentioned this, making an oath. But here there's another twist on it. Leviticus chapter 19, it says, Do not act deceptively. Do not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. What is deceitful here? There's deception because a person is trying to convince another person to believe them. Whether they're trying to make a business deal or they're trying to get something out of another person. They want to convince them to agree with them. And so the person will swear the oath or make a promise in the name of the Lord. In order to deceive the person. Unfortunately, this is not too far from 
how we might use God's name today. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, stop doing this. You're only heaping curses upon yourself because you're not actually fulfilling what you said you would do in the Lord's name. It'd be better for you to let your yes be yes and your no be no. What is Jesus saying? Why don't you just have the kind of character that people believed rather than needing to make up all this stuff to, to compel somebody, convince them that you're really going to follow through. We might not say, I swear in the name of the Lord to somebody, but we might say, God told me. We need to be careful saying those three words. God told me. Let's at least take a step back and say, I feel God telling me, or perhaps God is saying, or just say, I, I just feel this way. I think this is a good idea. What God has told us when we're trying to make decisions in life is to bring a multitude of counselors into the situation. What God has told us to do is to love our neighbor. There's so many things God has told us to do very clearly. And we can say, God told me to love my spouse. There's no debate about that. But when it comes to making decisions that the Bible does not direct us in, we should be careful to say, God told me, lest we use his name in vain. Lest we go about our way convincing other people that, nope, God really did call them to do this or leave here or go there or buy that. All for nothing. Just for them to be destroyed by their situation. Did God really tell them to do that? We find out in the end if he did or not and whether or not they were using his name in vain. Be careful by saying even simple things like God told me. There are so many other better ways that we could communicate what we feel we're being led to do. It's not as if the Holy Spirit does not lead us and guide us and direct us. Ephesians chapter 5 is all about walking in wisdom by the Holy Spirit. He says, be filled by the Spirit. Find out what is pleasing to the Lord. The Holy Spirit leads us. Absolutely. And we should seek and ask for God's guidance. But to say God told me, we just need to be careful about that. What do we really mean? And is there maybe a wiser way we could put it? When we misuse and outright abuse God's name, we miss out on the very purpose for which he gave it to us. That we might know who he is, number one, and number two, come to him for all that he is. God gave us his name so that we might take it up, so that we might use it, but for two specific purposes. That we might know who he is, and then why that we might come to him for all that he is. We see a final sobering example of people taking the Lord's name in vain and missing out on this ultimate purpose to be redeemed by the name of the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father. Listen to what they say to Jesus. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Well, what law did they break? They at least broke taking the Lord's name in vain because it evidently didn't help them. They were cast out in eternal judgment, despite having used the Lord's name so many times. What did it matter in the end? It was all for nothing, living a life proclaiming the Lord's name in all of these ways, thinking that we're in his good grace. All for nothing. They missed the purpose for which God gave us his name. To, to know him, to actually know him. Isn't it interesting? Jesus said, I never knew you. So that we might know him. But second, so that we might come to him and receive redemption. So we see this as we turn now toward the purpose. Jesus gave us the alternative. He says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the alternative. May your name be treated as holy. In my life and in the world, may your main name be treated as holy. We can take up God's name for something. As Jesus indicates here, it's not that we should never use God's name, but that when we use it, we must use it with respect, considering the holiness of God and the unique value for which he has given it. 
whatever you think you might be able to get out of God by using his name, God can give you more. God can give you much more than you could ever get out of him taking his name in vain. If we would just humble ourselves before him and be wanting to honor him for who he is, to actually receive what he has to give rather than to see what we can get, we would be so much more blessed than you could ever imagine, especially with our own ideas. And this is precisely why God's name is worthy of honor. So towards this purpose now, to know the Lord and to find life in his name. That's the purpose for God giving us his name. How does God giving us his name teach us about him? Tell us who he is. Well, it's actually much more like the way we use nicknames. We don't really use names so much for their significance, but we use nicknames for their significance. You might really like a nickname somebody gives you uh, because you, you think of yourself that way. Most of the times we despise the nicknames people give us. We don't want to be known like that, you know? My last name is Warmel. So when I was in, and I pronounced it that way on purpose. I mean, first of all, that's the only way I've ever heard it pronounced, but it's actually spelled W-O-R-M, worm. Ugh, nobody wants to call it a worm, but that's what they called me in the military, wormy. I did not like that nickname. There was nothing about a worm I felt I represented or wanted to aspire to. But that's exactly what names, how names are used in the Bible. It's, it's more like you existed and then you got a name because of something you've done or a kind of person that you became. We see this with Abraham. Abram, as he was originally called, father. But then when the Lord gives him a promise, says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations, the Lord changes his name in a way by adding the plural to the end of his name to be called Abraham. Now he's the father of fathers. We see this with Simon, one of the Lord's disciples. Jesus changes his name later to call him Peter, which means rock. He says, because on this, um, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. So it is with God's name, though in the reverse order, because he had all of his characteristics and attributes eternally, though he wouldn't reveal a name or pick one for himself until later on in time. His name is merely reflecting who he is, which is why he chose the name Yahweh as his favorite name, as his preferred name, because it means I am who I am. He called on Moses to confront Pharaoh to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses asked, what's your name? So I can tell Pharaoh about who sent me. God said, tell him Yahweh sent you, which is translated I am, or I am who I am. And although God would be known by his people through many different names to describe many different characteristics and attributes which he carried, he preferred this comprehensive yet very concise name, Yahweh, I am. What does I am mean? Here's a few thoughts. God is self-existent. He never came into existence. He's always been presently existing. He is self-existent. Nothing brought God into existence. Rather, God is the first cause, the one who brought everything and everyone into existence. He exists eternally. I am also means God has no potential. You and I hope that we all have potential. God doesn't have any potential because he already is all that he could ever be. He's already filled up and completed himself. He could never be more or less than what he is. We might think of doctrines like the immutability of God, which means God can never change because God is. And this means for us, we can always rely on God. You and I aren't always is, aren't we? So people might think more or less about our reliability, but God is. He says, I am. He's always reliable. He never changes because he has no potential. He's already filled up everything he would be. This is why when writing on the third commandment, thinking about the name of God and how it communicates what he's like, um, author Michael Horton titles the chapter, when he's writing on the Ten Commandments, he titles it, Guarding God's Reputation. The third commandment is about guarding God's own reputation to the world and how we use his name. Because all of the names of God are tied to his person and his work, who he is and what he does. 
They are meant to introduce us to the fullness of who he is. And at this point alone, we have enough reason to take the third commandment seriously. As I said, this elementary understanding of taking the Lord's name in vain is absolutely legitimate. Using God's name as a curse word or with a passant, flippant phrase. As Horton writes in this chapter, because casual use of God's name is prohibited precisely because it wears away our sensitivity to the enormous reverence that we owe it. One purpose for God revealing his name is so that we might know him for who he is. And if we knew him for who he is, we would fear him, we would respect him, and we would seek to honor him. We would flee from the idea of trying to use his name for any sort of self-serving purposes that we might have. And when we see God for who he is, we are exposed for all that we are not. For example, Yahweh is eternal. We are not. We are temporary. We are a wisp. We will be here today and gone tomorrow and forgotten by generations to come. God is holy and perfect and complete. We are not. We are corrupt and perpetually incomplete and continually fumbling over ourselves. God is consistent in his character. He is who he is. We are inconsistent. We are deceptively unreliable. We don't even know our own hearts and what we want sometimes. We are so unlike the God who is. And all the while we misuse or even abuse his name. Because of this, we deserve correction. We deserve judgment and ultimately condemnation. And yet this is where the tables turn. Because God chooses to redeem his people. Do you know why? So often one of the most repeated phrases in scripture, for his name's sake. I'm going to redeem you for my name's sake. In a way, we as God's people bear his name, as we see in the Aaronic blessing in the book of Numbers. You pronounce the Lord bless you and keep you. And he says, in in this way, you are putting my name on my people. Therefore, in the Israelite sin, They corrupted and profaned God's name among the nations, as he says through the prophet Ezekiel and the prophet Isaiah. You've profaned my name. You've you've not guarded my reputation. You've exploited it, and now I've become a laughingstock among all the nations. When I was supposed to be praised and revered among all the nations because of your example and your witness to the world. Therefore, he says through Ezekiel, for my name's sake... I will bring you back. I will sprinkle you clean. I will fill you with my spirit and cause you to walk in my ways. This is the purpose in order to vindicate his own name. And he does this through giving himself even more names to come. Through his son, as he said, through the prophet Isaiah. You are my people walking in darkness, having been washed over um, through the judgment of other nations coming in your lands. The prophecy comes, but you've seen a great light, and the light has dawned on all those who were once living in darkness. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given, the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Because God's name is holy and worthy of honor, he chose to redeem his people and not condemn them. And he did this by becoming like a human being, truly God and truly man, who through who we know as Jesus. And just like we learn about who God is through his names, we learn about what he does, how he saves through the name of Jesus. An angel told uh, Joseph, Mary is going to have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, which, by the way, is simply the Greek pronunciation of the Hebrew name Joshua, which means God saves. You're going to name him Joshua because, he says, you will, he will save his people from their sins. He goes on talking to Joseph. That all of this took place to fulfill was spoken through the prophet. The virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will give him a name, Emmanuel which means God with us. Jesus came from heaven to earth in order to be a human representative before God. And as he represented us before God, 
like a kind of witness or an attorney, he didn't leave us to pay the fine, but he actually paid it himself. Don't you wish your lawyers did that for you? Not only represented you, but paid your fines for you. This is what Jesus did. And he was able to pay the fine because he, as a human being, living and walking before the Lord, kept every commandment. He lived a perfectly obedient life. And then, to fulfill all the ceremonial and sacrificial law of the, the Israelites through the Mosaic Covenant, he died on a cross as a sacrificial lamb in the place of all those who would repent of their sin so that we could actually be cleansed of our sin so that whoever acknowledged their sin before God and called out to him in grace could be forgiven. Jesus died the death of a no name and was given the name that is above every name. We have this assurance that we can actually be forgiven and covered in Christ because when Jesus died, he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and God gave him the name which is above every name. It's not hard to think that the Lord says, no, you get to wear this now. A human being, imagine that. So that we human beings could come underneath the inheritance that he earned in heaven. And at his name, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That's probably meaning Yahweh, though we don't know because they were writing in Greek at the time. This is our assurance. So Michael Horton offers another reason we are not to misuse the name of the Lord. Because it's by this name that we are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. If you're not a Christian and you're here with us today, hey, kudos to you for having the courage to go to church, especially a small church. We want you to know the Lord, to actually be redeemed and reconciled and given the purpose for which you were created. There's nothing else for you to do. There's no rule for you to follow. This ten, these 10 commandments aren't for you. Don't even try. You need to come underneath Christ, the one who fulfilled God's law. You need to call out to the name that is above every name. Do not rely on your own strength. Jesus is this one. As the apostle John writes at the very end of his gospel in chapter 20, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written, the ones that I wrote about, so that you might believe in Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's our desire for you today. And there will be actually a time, a brief moment at the end of the sermon where everyone's going to have an opportunity to pray and to call out to God. That would be your moment, your time to cling to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, walking with the Lord as Christians, we have the commandments, right? These are for you. Uh, it's not like we graduate from the gospel to the law, but the law of God directs us in our life so that we can know what is pleasing to the Lord. And although we have been freed from the condemnation, which comes from the law, God gives us this direction. But it's frustrating because we are, we're still wearing the corruption of sin and death in our bodies and seeing it in our world and society. We're still wearing this corruption from which we have been liberated in which we will only experience final liberation in the resurrection. This is where God's name comes to us as an ever-present help. As Chuck read from Psalm 145, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. That means with sincerity, without calling on him in vain. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him, and he hears their cry and saves them. Or Proverbs chapter 18, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are protected. And this is why we as God's people pray in Jesus' name. It's not because God needs to hear it, but because we need to hear it. We need to remember that we are going to God through Jesus. Lest, on the one hand, we come in irreverently, forgetting about Christ and all that he has done. Or, second, be held back and not think that God cares to hear us. When we pray in Jesus' name, it, rem it reminds us, God is our father because of Jesus, who longs to hear his children. Now, I would not appreciate it if 
all the children in Sandwich came into my office whenever they wanted. I would need to get some things done, and it might be nice from time to time, but eventually I would probably either change a new secret office, build a bunker or something, or just have a sign. Except for two kids. My kids. They'll probably have a key one day. They can come in any time as my children. This is why we pray in Jesus' name. Lest we get it twisted. Lest we put the law back on ourselves and think we approach God our own way on our own merits or be too timid to come to him altogether. Are there things in life that you think are too little for this awesome God to hear? There's nothing too little for him to hear. When you come to him in the name of Jesus and speak the words, our father. The Lord told us his name so that we would know what he is like and come to him for all that he is. Now finally, character. What kind of character or virtue should well up within us as we walk along God's um, ways towards the duty or towards the purpose and goals for which he gave his law? As a young child, we'd go to my grandmother's house for Christmas Eve every year in Vermont. And we would get, we would get the talk. You better behave yourself. And if we practiced the belief in Santa, they would have probably said something like, Santa's still watching. You better behave. Well, I never heard a more stern, you better behave, than the, than the moments before I met President Barack Obama. When I was in the military, I was doing embassy security. So I had the privilege of traveling all over the world uh, on, on security operations I felt like I should not have been on. Uh, it, it was incredible to be a kid from Lemonster and to be outside uh, Secretary of State's bedroom eating his leftover chicken. Well, when we were, we were in Wales uh, one day and we got the news, hey, in a couple hours, we're going to be able to go uh, on a trip. We didn't know what that meant, but that meant that we were about to meet Barack Obama. And it's there that we heard the most stern, you better behave yourself that I have ever heard in my life. It was a very quick, hello, I am Sergeant Ethan Warmel. I am from Lemonster, Massachusetts, and I will be going away from you right now. You know, like just quick, get out and don't mess anything up. It would be foolish to try to crack a joke or to be too personal. This is the president and he's acting right now as president of our nation. There's a certain reverence. There's a certain, I remember the moment that he walked around the building and I saw him and he was very close. And I was like, oh my goodness. You know, I didn't know if I'd see him in the flesh, let alone this close. There's just like an aura around people with, with high status in society. And there's a reverence, there's a respect, a humility that, that is fitting for that moment. It is fitting for us to learn that and to have this. This should be no different for God's people who bear his name. We should have a reverence and a respect, and we should reflect that in our life and how we use God's name. The, commun the watching world around us, our community, our friends and neighbors who don't know the Lord, they should know that we honor the Lord, that we respect him, that when he's in the room, it's di everything's different. And that there is a moment when we button up because we want to hold him in high esteem and give him the honor that he is due. We should be reverent people. We should be humble people because of this commandment. But I think it's interesting that President Obama had two daughters that he basically raised in the, in the White House. Eventually, they became teenagers. I don't know if you ever saw that movie, the Disney movie, My Date with the President's Daughter. But Duncan meets this girl. They hit it off. They go on a date. She says, hey, let me introduce you to my dad. Here's my address. Come pick me up for the date. And he pulls up to the White House. I'm sure that had to have happened to the Obama girls. I mean, they did go to school. I wonder if they had a sleepover at the White House. I wonder if they ever said, hey, let's go meet my dad. And then it sinks in. Who we're going to see here. Perhaps we would hesitate coming to the Lord. Perhaps we would hesitate and wonder if we deserve to be in his presence or if we're qualified to be there at all. But being a child makes all the difference. Being a son or daughter makes all the difference. 
I would never walk into the president's office on my own. But if I was behind one of his daughters, perhaps I would. There'd be a completely different view of me being with them. So it is with Jesus. That's why Jesus came to become a human being. So that we could kind of hide in his wake, if you will. The theological term is to be united to Christ. To be, to be united to him through the Holy Spirit. So that we can come into God's office. So we can be with the Lord. And because of this, look how it shapes us. It shapes us into confident people. We should be reverent, but we should have a certain confidence about us. We shouldn't be wondering if something's too little for us to bring to God. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 3, In Christ, we have boldness and confident access to God. The author of Hebrews writes in Ephesians chapter 4, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. Imagine that. What fool would be so bold to march into the president's office, let alone the throne room of God. Only a son. And when you are in Christ, you are a child of God. We should be bold and confident. Despite how timid we might feel uh, at times, knowing we are children of God. Do not approach God or use his name recklessly, yet never hesitate to call on him in a time of need for any reason because for whoever has repented of their sin and clung in faith to Jesus alone for their standing before God has been made a son or a daughter by the Holy Spirit this is such good news praise God for the third commandment let's take a moment uh, to pray now this is time for you to pray I think I'm done praying for you today it's time for you to pray for you is there a way that God has called you to respond to him? Is there something that has been prompted in your heart by the Lord, perhaps? Is there something the sermon made you think about that you need to pray about? Let's take a quiet moment to respond to God in prayer. Praise him for who he is. Repent of sin that might be in your heart. Cling to Christ again. Be renewed by his grace.